just look at the region of X4, let's say, it looks like it's a local sink. But then X3 also has a saddle behavior. Maybe X2 has a local sink property as well. But the question that we're most interested in is not necessarily the local behavior, but the global behavior of the system. In other words, if this system is allowed to run for a very long time, will it settle into one state in particular? So will it specifically go into one point or two points? So we have to start asking these types of questions. Because this is just depicting the local behavior. We actually want to know what the long time behavior is. So that's the type of question we'll start to go to. So that's a nice diagram. Okay. So remind me Okay, so to do that, we must talk about the concept of invariant set. Okay, so definition. We say that a set, so maybe one, one and a half more lectures on purely theoretical stuff, and starting next week or Wednesday, my hope is that we'll start to do nothing but very interesting in that. And not basic ones, like interesting ones. So this will pay off, my hope. Okay, so we did say a set S, which is a subset of Rn, is an invariant set. Um, means that For all x, so for all points in this set, and for all time, the flow evaluated at that point is in the set. So that's what we mean by invariant. Common. So what does this mean? So we can say the following. If S is an invariant <laughs> set, and at some point, let's say x0 is in this set, then the orbit, which I defined for you last time as gamma of x0, belongs to S. So in other words, if I start in my invariant set, I have to stay in my invariant set. That's another way of looking at it. So my orbit at this point does not leave the set. So what is an example you know right off the top of your head of the simplest invariant set? Right. No. Think about it. Equilibrium. Right. Yeah, okay. Okay, yeah. <laughs> you want to be a generalist. But does everybody understand why the equilibrium point is an example of an invariant set? Because, as I said, the equilibrium point stays in the system. So an orbit applied to an equilibrium point doesn't change the position of the orbit. Oh, okay. I was thinking when you go into work. Yeah, yeah. Think of it. So the equilibrium doesn't, doesn't change. Exactly. So it's the simplest example of invariant set. If I'm at an equilibrium point, I'm always at that equilibrium point. So that's the simplest example of an invariant set. Okay. But there are more. So, example. Um, so, as a, the best example is an equilibrium point. And also a periodic orbit system. So, we talked about this last time. Where if you are stuck in a periodic orbit, you must return to where you started from. So by definition, that's the invariant set. Okay. So the question is, given a differential equation, how can we find the invariant sets of the dynamics? So there's a trick, actually. To do. And this trick, uh, for some reason, is not well publicized. So I'm afraid if I tell you, you'll, be, you'll know the secret. And I don't want to give it away, because I use it all the time. But then, okay, it's okay, I, I, I should tell you. Save you from reading it. Okay, so how to find invariant 
So I'm spending time on this because it's an extremely important idea. So there's a bit of an algorithm, I guess, but it's very straightforward. So given a dynamical system on Rn and some C1 function, so remember this means that it has continuous first partial derivatives. And call this function Z, capital Z. And it goes from Rn to Rn, or Rn to R. So it's a scalar function. And let me denote the derivative of Z along solution. of the dynamical system or along the floor, what I really mean to say. Uh, somebody's put their phone in all chalk this phone. It's okay. So, should I move it here for you maybe? So, the question is the following. If I have a function that represents solutions to my dynamical system. How can I describe solutions along the curves of that solution? What type of derivative? Say it again. Directional. And specifically, what about the directional derivative? Great, who said it? Great, very good. The same thing. Good. So in other words, we can define the derivative along solutions as the gradient, which measures how much you're moving along the curve. So Z prime then is defined as gradient of Z dot product with f of x, where f of x is the right-hand side of my dynamical system. So remember, we have x prime is equal. So the dot product of this function z with respect to f tells you how solutions are moving along the curves. So in the diagram before, that's how I got the arrows along the curves. The arrows tells you the direction in which solutions are moving. So that's a definition, what we mean by z prime. Okay, so proposition. Consider, once again, my dynamical system, x prime is equal to f of x. Okay. If I can define a function, let's say z, that goes from Rn to R, which satisfies the following. Let's say z prime is equal to alpha times z, where Alpha is some function, let's say Rn to R. So, if you do your work and you come across a system of differential equations, and it has this nice form, one of the equations in your list, where z prime is equal to alpha z, where alpha is some function. So if you can uniquely write it like this, one of the equations, or multitude of the equations in your dynamical system, then you can say the following. Then, we have that z greater than 0, z equal to 0, or z less than 0, are in fact the invariant sets of the denominator. That's the trick, how you find it very important. Yes? Um, so, gradient uh, uh, that would be like the rescaling factor? Um, it's how you measure how the solution is moving along, in what direction and what speed are along the curve of the solution. Okay. That's what you mean by gradient, right? So, yeah. 
that you basically get. So, uh, for, for, this, for this statement here, yes. is it, um, is it, could be one of them or all of them? Or a mixture? Or a mixture of them. Or all of them. Or okay. So, let's see an example. So, let's say I ask you to solve, let's say x prime is equal to um, sine y times x and y prime is equal to x squared plus y squared. So a nonlinear system of equations. What would be the invariant sets of this parameter? So which one of these, so this is a coupled system, it's a nonlinear system. Comparing to the definition there, which of these equations matches that definition? The first one. Right? And you can't write the second one as some function times what. You can only do it to the first one. So therefore then what are the invariant sets of the system? Yes. So what are the invariant sets then? It has to be x is greater than zero, x is less than zero, or x is zero. Right? Just by applying that. So therefore if you look here, this is the same. Alpha times x. So therefore, x greater than zero is an invariant set, or less than zero, or equal to zero. It depends on the case. This is a simple example. I just want to illustrate the definition. Does everybody understand? So it's that simple. So if you can look at your system of equations and you can write any one of them in that form, then you can immediately pull out what the invariant sets are. And this is a very useful trick because it's very difficult often to find out what the invariant sets of the system are, aside from solving for the equivalent. Okay. Any questions on this? So I just wanted to illustrate this very important. So why am I talking about invariant sets? So before I say this, let me introduce the concept of what you mean by a monotone function. So a thing that is very also important in dynamic. Okay. So let S be an invariant set. And let Z Defined from the domain of S to R. So now my function Z, its domain is this invariant. It goes to R. Okay. We say that Z is monotone decreasing or increasing. So I'll put increasing in brackets, just to say room. If the following is true, z prime, which I define as nabla z dot f, is less than zero. So if you compute this derivative and it's less than zero, we say that the function is monotone decrease. If it's greater than zero, it's monotone increase. So that's how you tell whether a function is what we call monotone decreasing or increasing. You compute the z prime, you fix it within some invariant set S, and you observe the sign. So that's what it means to be monotone decreasing. And why is this significant? It is significant because of the problem. Set once again. Then this set S 
we can say contains no equilibrium points. periodic orbits or homoclinic orbits. In other words, if you have some very complicated, now notice this, I told you what the invariant sets were without actually having to solve or plot or do anything with the system. I looked at it, applied the proposition, and I told you what the invariant sets were. Okay, so now you can have some very complicated system of equations and you won't know how to solve it. Maybe it's even hard to find what the equilibrium points are because you're solving nonlinear equations. But if you can find an invariant set and also a monotone function corresponding to that invariant set, then what that tells you is that in that set you will not have any equilibrium points or complicated orbits. So it saves you a lot of work. It simplifies the type of solution you would have immensely. Finding monotone functions is another story entirely. Yes? Okay, so uh, just to clarify. Yes. Okay, so when we have uh, the gradient of, let's say, V, yes. that says at some point, will it uh, mask the rate of change? Uh, In what direction? And yes. So then apply to this. see next week when we do examples of trying to find monotone functions, it's a pretty hard thing to do. So, but if you can do it, you can simplify your life tremendously because the set you're working in now has none of this extra stuff you have to worry about. So you can jump into it. You can not worry about it. So a lot of mathematicians spend a great deal of time looking at dynamic systems trying to find invariant sets and or monotone functions because it allows them to simplify the problem tremendously. But it's not a trivial thing, because we're not anymore in the land of solving linear equations to get equilibrium points. Try solving this system. It's not that difficult, because I wrote it down. But you can imagine something more general. It's pretty hard to find. OK, so let me now move on. From OK, so I said go back to that triangle diagram I drew before. We have two types of behaviors to worry about. One is what behaviors look like in the local vicinity of some equilibrium point. So the x1, x2, x3, x4, but also the global behavior, as I said. So this type of stuff, finding invariant sets, monotone functions, will help us tremendously finding the global behavior, the long-term behavior of the system. But also we should talk about what it means to talk about local behavior near equilibrium. So let me mention some things about And my hope is now you'll start to see some interesting things. So, behavior near equilibrium. Let me go back to the land of linear differential equations for a second. So go back to my case where x prime was this matrix A times x. So linear dynamical system. Let me go back there for a moment. Okay. And of course it's on part n. And now, once again, let me consider the eigenvalue of A and remember this can be complex and not necessarily distinct, right? So the most general case I'm asking you to consider. So 
just look at the eigenvalues of A and also the associated eigenvalues. Forget about solving it. I want to be more descriptive than that. So what do I mean by that? I mean the following. I will denote by E with the S at the top. And this is simply span of S1 to Sn. I will explain what the S1 to Sn means. The second subspace is the unstable subspace. I've never written so much in my life. <laughs> which I would denote as E with a U at the top for unstable. And this is a span of some vectors, call them U1 to a U1. So that's the stable subspace, you have an unstable subspace, and you have one more which we call the center subspace. And you can imagine, I will call it E C. And this is span of C1 all the way to C1. Now what are these? They are the eigenvectors corresponding to the negative eigenvalues, positive eigenvalues, and zero. This is why I was leaving the case of the zero eigenvalues till now, because I wanted to put it in a more general context. So in other words, where S1 to Sn are the eigenvectors corresponding to my negative eigenvalues or more properly with the real part of the eigenvalues so real part of lambda is less than zero. U1 to Un is the same thing but for the positive eigenvalue. So where the real part of lambda is greater than zero. And then C1 to Cn is where the real part is zero. So, in other words, in other words, I can write Rn as the following. E as composed with EU, composed with E. I can describe Rn completely in terms of its stable space, unstable space, and center space. Does everybody know this notation? The cross with the circle around it? It means direct sum. From the neuron. You don't need to know too much about this. Just a small type on the second one. 
you, you tell me. Yes, there is. You're trying to test me. Okay. Yeah. Are you testing us, Rich? <laughs> <laughs> Not as yet, at least. Okay. Now, the idea is the following. I'll show you an example. You know how to do this. Maybe it's not. Maybe you've not written it out like this, but you know how to do this. You can describe Rn completely in terms of its stable subspace, unstable subspace, and tender subspace. That's remarkable. But apparently I'm the only one that thinks this. I don't know how. So go back to your exam question. You'll see what I mean. So I, I wrote it down because I forgot what it was. So let's say you have to solve x prime. Or well, let's say we're not that much interested in solving these things anymore because we cannot do it in the more general case. So your first exam question was something like this. One, one, four, one, x. And now we're not even going to write in a matrix form anymore. I'm going to just, like I did for the first example, I write it down in equation form. Because there's no point. I can't write a nonlinear system in matrix form. So let me do it here. So this corresponds to the system x prime is equal to x plus y, and y prime is equal to 4x plus y. What are the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this function? So say I don't care about solving anymore. I'm just asking you, based on what we've done, what are the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix? So if you remember, well, maybe you don't remember, but if you did on your exam, one of the eigenvalues was 3, the other one was minus 1. And the eigenvector corresponding to 3 was 1, 2. The eigenvector corresponding to minus 1 was minus 1. Two. I believe that's it. Okay, so now let's look at our definition. What is the dimension of the space of my system? So it's R2. Right? Okay. That's the first thing. Good. How many positive eigenvalues do I have? So how many eigenvectors do I have corresponding to the positive eigenvalue? How many negative eigenvalues do I have? And how many eigenvectors do I have corresponding to the negative eigenvalue? How many zero eigenvalues do I have? So what is the dimension of my stable subspace? Why is it one? Because Remember, what does it mean to have a stable subspace? It only contains the eigenvectors with negative eigenvectors. How many, what is the dimension of my unstable subspace? And what is the dimension of my standard subspace? Very good. It's that simple. You know how to do it. It's just the terminology is confusing. So we can write that R2 is decomposed <coughs> into ES and E. Where the eigenvectors, it's a vector space, so it'll contain vectors. But the vectors that these spaces contain are the eigenvectors. So for ES, this is simply the minus 1, 2. And this is simply 1, 2. It's that simple. So let's do another one. I'll do the second example. And you see, now we can tell you a lot about the solutions of the system, qualitatively, because we know what it means now to have a stable section of my base space and an unstable. So I know now what the orbits are going to do in the vicinity of these equations. And I know where they're going to do them further, because I know what these are. I can draw these up. Okay. So the second example. Was slightly more complicated, but it was minus 3 root 2 root 2 minus 2x. And you found that the eigenvalues of this, or at least I hope you found, was minus 4 and minus 1. And the eigenvector corresponding to minus 4 was minus root 2 1. And for minus 1 was 1 over root 2 1. So, what is the dimension of the system? R2. Now, how many zero eigenvalues do I have? How many negative eigenvalues? And how many positive eigenvalues? 
So I only have enough S tables as well. So R2 completely is Where ES now, if you want to write it up, is the span of the so minus two one, one two. That's it. So we can, as you can start to see, we can tell you a lot about solutions to an equation without actually ever having to solve it. Yes? Okay, so, <clears throat> so you're saying that um, R2 is equal to the label something? In this case. So what happens, okay, so let's say you're given R2 is equal to um, purely a stable substrate. Yes. And then you also say R2 is equal to a purely unstable substrate. So aren't you describing the same vector space as if you're saying it's different? What? Um, how can it be in this case, though, that you have an unstable substrate? No, I'm saying another example where R2 is, let's say, is Oh, unstable. so that's right. So we fix Rm to be context dependent on the system we use. So it's more abstract, but at the same time, we just assume everything is an RM. But yeah, don't get confused. This is a different R2 than the R2 we had done before. Okay. Now, if you can find a homeomorphism that relates this question to the other one, then they're the same, as you know now. But in general, they are different. But so in this case, the entire phase plane is a stable substrate. So all orbits in this system approach the equation, every single one. In this situation, you'll have some of the orbits that will approach this direction, but they will be repelling this. So you have a way of qualitatively describing. Is that clear? Not with an example. Two examples. More or less. Okay. So I will. I will. I hope I erased the right goal yes. In my morning lecture in calculus, I, I wrote one board. It took me about 11 minutes to write, and I erased it, <laughs> not knowing that what I was doing. Uh, I upset a lot of students because uh, I disrupted their note taking. It's not good. OK. <coughs> All right. So that's a linear system. So let's. Now that we understand what we mean, actually, by describing the behavior of solutions of the new system, let's go back to the general knowledge. Because as I said, this works great when you have a coefficient of number. I can immediately write down what the eigenvalues and eigenvectors are. But in the nonlinear case, I cannot do this. So what do I do? So how can I describe now solutions for full nonlinear? And the idea is to Called linearization, as you may have imagined. And in particular, the fundamental theorem here is called the Hartman Grobman, which I will not prove, I will not even try to prove. Yes? So no more. Right. Not, 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 not. Okay. So you know how when you have um, a, a linear system, yes. linear system, then you have um, eigenvalues, eigenvectors yes. for that system. Yes. So let's say we're given uh, a nonlinear system. Yes. Is there an analogous thing where you have eigen functions or eigen something? Yes. Yeah. The R two goes into R. Oh, is it? <laughs> it's related to. But yes, you do. Um, in general. Eigenfunctions come from dealing with infinite dimensional vector spaces. They will not show up with Rn, they will show up with R infinite. So it's just called eigenfunctions. Yes. Eigenfunctions occur in the case where you are trying to find uh, solutions to partial differential equations. So the idea is you can actually, if you want to solve a PDA in the most general way, you can decompose it into an infinite set of ordinary differential. And then each solution to that is an eigenfunction. So you'll learn this next year when you do what is called Stern linguistics. But it's analogous to this. You have an eigenvalue problem, and instead of solving for eigenvectors, you're solving for eigenfunctions. So it's, I can show you. It's a good question. So what does this mean? So let's go 
back to our knowledge. So consider, once again, my dynamical system, x prime is equal to the most general case. And once again, it's on R. In fact, you can impress your friends when you take PDAs, because you can say, I'm working in infinite dimensional linear algebra. They'll be very impressed. I won't impress them. Yeah, they don't, they don't impress them. <laughs> I don't have any. Oh. <laughs> it's okay. Mike Tad is my <laughs> He's very, he's a very nice person. Okay, is of class C1. So remember, I'm assuming it's C1 because I want to assume I can do existence and unique okay. okay. But it's not important. Anyways, consider X prime C2. Okay. If A is an equilibrium point of the system. So where, what does it mean once again if A is an equilibrium point of the system? How do I write this? Very good. So if that condition is true, then what can we say? The linear approximation of F, which is the right hand side of my dynamical system, at this equilibrium point A is given by what? <coughs> Multivariable people, what do I do? Just use the first two. Uh, first two. two. Two would be sufficient. You can do three if you want. Two is so f of x, I can approximate by, as Don said, the derivative matrix, which I would call DFA, evaluated at some point x. What in the world is this DFA? It's the Jacobian mission. Where DF of A is given by DF of I, DF. Or if you want to write it on matrix form, which is more useful, I guess, recall that it just looks like this. So DF of 1, DX1, all the way to DF1, DXN, DFN, DX1 all the way to the <coughs> So your right hand side is a vector field, so you have f1, f2, f3, just like it was before, and this is how you take the logic of it. And we evaluate each one of these derivatives at a. So you get a number. So, for mm -hmm. a non-linear system, yes? But may shift to the part of the equation? No, 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 I just mean, so df of a, which I call the Jacobian, is, is this. You've seen this before, right? Jacobian matrix, I hope. Others, I'd be very foolish right now. Um, okay. So in other words, for a nonlinear system, if I know what the equilibrium points are, I can describe something about that system in the neighborhood of the equilibrium points by computing the Jacobian. And we know how to do this because we know what f is. It's given to us. So it's very easy to do. So what can we say? So what is the hope of doing this? Why do I want to do this? And my hope is the following. That the solution so let me denote this just for, well, okay, more time. before I write my hope down, let me uh, say something. So then I can transform my dynamical system from x prime to fx through this linear approximation. Namely that, let's say, 
u prime is equal to gf at a of z. So by doing this approximation, now I can state my goal. And let me call this for brevity equation stop. That can be so. The hope is that the solution of my linearized system, stop, will approximate the solution of the nonlinear differentiation. Um, in a neighborhood of the equilibrium point A. So that's how I do nonlinear dynamics. I keep taking linear approximations in neighborhoods of my equilibrium. Is this equivalent to when you did manifolds when you said you can approximate the manifold with a non in that local area? That's exactly what I'm doing here too. Because what technically have I done by doing this linear approximation? By introducing a matrix, I've induced a vector space. So my curved nonlinear system is some manifold, and now in my tangent space, I'm doing this derivative approximation. So that's why I talked to it. So that is the machinery I rely on. But the hope is this. So if I can solve the linearized system, it will approximate solutions to the nonlinear system. And in fact, that is the statement of the Hartman's um, So I will just write down one more definition, and then we will continue on Monday. So definition. So given, once again, x prime is equal to f of x, and in equilibrium point, x is equal to a, we say that this equilibrium point is what we call hyperbolic if all eigenvalues of my Jacobian matrix, so df of a, have non zero real points. So, if you compute the eigenvalues of this Jacobian matrix at that point, and they're all non-zero real parts, we say those equilibrium points are hyperbolic. And I will continue from here on Monday. I just find it remarkable that people realize that you can determine stability properties just by looking at signs of eigenvalues. The fact that Poincaré, who was the person that basically came up with this stuff, Harman and Grobman formalized it many years later, but the fact that he's given a nonlinear system says, yeah, look at the eigenvalues of the Jacobian. I think that's genius, but no. So I'm not the other.